Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Oh, 100%. Wow. Yeah, and I've, I've in multiple shows in, in the past, I have talked about, uh, honestly, I, I think these sex crimes, especially the ones against children, are actually more damaging than even homicides. Because, you know, when, you, when a loved one is murdered, then their pain is gone. Uh, obviously, their memories and, and uh, the act, uh, that lingers. But the psychological damage, the physical damage, the, um, the ongoing memories that this child is going to grow up with and, and maintain and, and think about, and especially if, if it happens over extended period of time, then that, the psyche of that person is so damaged that it can be generational. And uh, to, yeah. and to me, it's just, I, I understand, I understand the, and especially because most, most murders is, are, you know, it's, it's an act of rage or jealousy or something like that. And it's a, it's kind of a one-time thing, but, um, boy, the evil that you talk about, and, and I, I appreciate you explaining all that and just kind of, um, laying it out there for us is just that what, what derangement do these people have to have in their minds that they look at a child, an innocent young child, and just look at it like a piece of meat that is so much more valuable than, uh, you know, even a prostitute or, or another person. It's just to may, maybe get into that a little bit, Paul. I mean, when you, when you talk about, you know, being face to face with a trafficker, um, so, I mean, you, you seem like a, you, you know, you're a man of, of, of faith and, uh, family and, and you, you understand you've had the good life. You understand the good that can be, that can come from life. And then you run in face to face with somebody like that. What, what is that experience like? Well, I'll tell you after that first encounter at that restaurant in Cartagena and we, we told them, look, I'm going to be having a party in a couple of weeks and you just bring all your inventory together. And, and, uh, I, I stayed in contact over that two week period. I exchanged uh, phone numbers and my, my new undercover number and WhatsApp with, uh, with the trafficker that had the piece of property that he wanted to develop into the child brothel sex resort. And I still have screenshots of that conversation back and forth. Here's what's scary, Jared. He had kids of his own. He sent me a picture of him smiling with his three-year-old daughter in his back seat. Now, this guy had 14 children that he was selling, right? And many of these traffickers sell their own kids. Now, he wasn't selling his three-year-old yet. But he, he said... He said, I think that God sent you to me because now with this resort I'm building, I'm going to have all the money I need to take care of, you know, my family and whatever else. And I'm like, you're right. God did send me to you so that I can ensure that that three-year-old doesn't have to grow up with a man who's selling children and who will likely sell her. It's interesting how many of these traffickers have uh, had I, I actually bought jewelry off of the traffickers. They would they would have a you know a chain that that and you would think you would think that these chains would have like devil horns and you know like satanic ri- no a lot of these traffickers had had crosses on their chains. I'm like really is that you just trying to justify what, what that do you not have a conscience? Do you not understand that that Christ's teachings hadn't were the farthest away from what you're doing that you could possibly imagine. Right. And, and, and it was, it was a, it was a strange phenomenon. How many of them were, were kind of, you know, 
trying to justify or, or make up for the evil by, by having their rosary or having their cross or whatever else. And it was, that was, that was fascinating to me. Not very many of these traffickers had, had tattoos of, of, of scorpions on their cheeks, you know? Now, yeah. the, there, there were a lot that were, and there were some super dangerous, super dangerous situations that we were in with some pretty high level traffickers that, that were super smart. And, um, I had, I had one where, where we had, we had connected with this one trafficker and, uh, he was, he was like six foot three, big guy and everybody cowered to him, scared to death of this guy. Um, the, the guys in the clubs everywhere was just, you could tell he, he was man in charge. And then he said to me, he goes, he said, Pablo, he called me up on my burner phone. He goes, we're going to, we're gonna, I need, we need to meet. We need to meet. We connect together. And, and he jumps in the car. I've got my operators in there. I said, we, we're going to go see some more ch- children because if he takes me where the kids are, then I, I, we can geotag them. Right. And I can, I said, no, we're setting this up for my boss. You take me more kids. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you some more. And so he had taken us to some of the places that were holding the kids. And then he, and he said, I'm going to take you to, he says, you know, I'm the king, right? I said, what do you mean you're king? He said, I'm the boss. I said, oh yeah, it's very obvious. You're the boss of this whole city. He said, every boss has a boss and I'm going to take you to see my boss. He said, he's in charge. He's in charge of everything from this city to this city. And his family's in charge of most of the country. And, and uh, his family was like cartel, hard, hardcore. We found out later he wasn't connected with them, but he was running the entire, um, cartel organization in that area and um we we get out of the car he's man in charge and you could see multiple guys that were that had eyes on us and um um he has me pull out my phone and he has me give me his my business card fortunately i had everything set up right where my undercover card had a phone number that i had memorized and he holds my card and he has said tell me your phone number if I didn't have that undercover number memorized like that, we would have been shot for sure. And then he said, pull out your phone, show me your phone. And I, I pull out my phone and I'm showing it to him. And he starts dialing on his phone just to make sure that it rung on mine, that the whole thing was set up. Fortunately, all the undercover stuff was set up properly. The phone rang. He smiles. He said, I like you. And then he took us to go see the kids. There's some super dangerous guys, but... What was amazing to me, Jared, is that the, the, what I call the level one guys, the guys selling me cocaine at two in the morning in downtown, you know, some Port-au-Prince or Mexico city or wherever those are, those guys, you know, they know the street they're, they're dangerous nonetheless, but you know, those are mostly guys, the level two ones, they're, they're the pimps. They're the ones that, that, uh, are selling 20, 25 year old women and they control them. They're traffickers but they have access to the children. And what I call a level three are the ones who physically control the children, the ones that, that, and we need to get to a level three. By the time you get to a level three, the ones who are holding the kids, almost 50% of them were women. I was like, how does that happen? Right? How does that happen? A lot of them were trafficked themselves when they were younger. And ended up working with the traffickers later and, and being groomers with them. So the real question is, how do we fix this? Because I, I realized that, that going undercover, pulling 20 children out at a time, yeah, that created a massive impact in that child's life. We got them back on their feet, got them in a healthy home or back to their parents. But if not enough was being done to fix the demand, then 20 more children would be sucked back into the recesses of hell to fill it. So what we have to figure out is how to fix that. And we've got operators right now who are averaging over 20 pedophiles a month that they are arresting. And every single one of those pedophiles represent 10 to 100 children that they would abuse at some time in their life. So getting them off the streets is super important. But at the same time, you've got to figure out what got that woman to the point where she thought it was okay to continue selling kids. And what got that trafficker to the point where he thought that it was okay to be making money 
you know, building the sex hotel for kids that, that he was going to be selling. And, and, and what is it that takes people down that dark road where they're part of the demand side? And that's the question we have to ask. You know, we all sit back and think that pornography is a victimless crime. You're, you're in the privacy of your own office. You're looking at your computer. Nobody cares. Nobody matters. Whatever. They, what people don't understand is what that does to your mind. When you take a, divine, a woman from a divine feminine to an object, you start going down a dark road. In fact, any time we start objectifying somebody else, any time that we put ourselves in a place where we look at another human being as anything other than a divine child of God, any time we go down that road, then, then if arrogance and ego start coming in and, and, and just, uh, or, or, or people dealing with their own pain that they, have, ha they haven't resolved and they're taking that out on other people and anger and, and, and physical abuse and even sexual abuse, and then they continue down this road and their, their pornography goes from being addicted to, to some hardcore pornography, to needing something harder to have that same fix, just like a drug. And for some of them, a little bit harder is a little bit younger, a little bit younger. Pretty soon they're fantasizing about something they wouldn't have even thought was attractive five years ago. And then they're acting out on these horrific fantasies. So yes, that is a big contributing factor. Now, everybody who's listening to us right now, almost everybody has seen pornography, right? Just because you've seen pornography doesn't mean you're becoming a pedophile. But every one of these guys that we arrested started out with a, a hardcore addiction. Then you have to ask yourself, what is it that, that, that takes people down that dark road? And how do we break that chain way, way, way before a child is involved? Yeah. That is the question. I mean, what, what is it that takes uh, people down any kind of a path that is, is really, uh, you know, not, not even necessarily sadistic, but, you know, inflicting pain on other people. And, and, you know, what is it that, I don't know, it's just so interesting when you think about the, the spark and that light of God that everybody is born with. And then over, over time, you know, what is it that, kind of diminishes and then eventually snuffs that out. And sometimes it's being forced on, on you from other people, like what you're talking about with these, these children. But a lot of times we just allow life to just get to us and just forget where we came from and, and forget that, like you said, uh, every single one of us is a divine child of God. And the moment we forget that and place other things in front of that, I think that, um, that that just kind of enables us to start going down paths that we normally wouldn't go and it's it's sad and ultimately you know you asked what um uh, what can we do about that and i i think clearly to solve the problem completely only god can do that and uh but us as you know people here on this earth um especially ones that allow you know our physical to overcome everything else because i it's interesting, Paul, as you're describing these situations, um, I like to get into people's, you know, try to get into people's minds. And, you know, I talk to criminal psychologists and, and serial killer type of experts. And what, what is it about, you know, is it a trigger somewhere, you know, something that just clicks and, and makes, makes them go a different path. You know, when they get to the, to the top of whatever mountain they're climbing and, you know, instead of going the safe direction and the more humane direction, they go this other way. And, you know, is, is there something that snaps and typically not, but there's always going to be choices that people make. And I, I think even these traffickers, especially it's just mind boggling to think that a guy can love his own children or at least, you know, have some, some relationship with a, his three-year-old. And yet go to work, you know, work when I, in quotations and, and, and be able to, I mean, it's a child. Yeah. It is a poor, innocent, 
uh, child that, that can't fight back. I mean, this child has no options against you and to, to, I don't know. That's just, I don't think most people even comprehend the amount of evil and callousness that it takes to actually do that. Yeah. You know, thank God it's one of those where, you know, how, how blessed are we that, that most people don't understand how to, and can't do that you know, and, and would never be able to do that. But the, the people that can, uh, are, are the ones that I just think that just allow themselves to get so dark inside. And, and so I don't know if they're bitter, if they're, uh, just damaged, you know, they just say, screw it. You know, I, I, I've gone down this far. It doesn't matter from now on, you know, what I do. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I, again, I, I look at these, these situations and I'm like, what, what are these people, what is it that has brought them to this point that they could actually do that? Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.